All of our Washington correspondents, Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes, Chief Election and Campaign Correspondent Robert Costa, and Congressional Correspondent Scott McFarland. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Great to be with you. As always, Nancy, I want to start with you. You covered the Hill for a very long time, covered a lot of hearings. What's the purpose of this hearing? There are a couple of main goals here. First of all, John, I think it's important both for the present time and for posterity for Americans to have a common understanding of the set of facts of what led up to the day and what happened on that day. You just heard Congressman Kinzinger talk about the fact that there are some powerful politicians out there whose stories about what happened, what led up to it, are already changing. And we're heading into a midterm election. It's important to remind people what actually happened. Beyond that, anytime this nation has ever had a major trauma, a major incident, Congress has been the body that takes the big 360 view of what happened so that we learn what can be gleaned from that experience, how we can do better next time. I mean, imagine after 9-11, if there had been no 9-11 commission to examine not just, you know, what happened the day that those planes flew into buildings, but also what were the intelligence gaps that led to these different agencies not talking to one another. Um, that led to the creation of the Department of, of National Intelligence. Bob, I want to, from the 360 uh, degree view, let's go down to a single moment of testimony. Uh, we're going to play from the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Milley, General Milley. We're going to play some of the testimony and then I want to get your reaction to it. There were th uh, two or three calls with Vice President Pence. He was very animated and he issued very explicit uh, very direct, unambiguous orders and to Secretary Miller. Get the military down here, get the guard down here, put down this uh, situation, uh, et cetera. So, Bob, your book, Peril, opens with, with Milley. Explain why that testimony was important and what it led to. That testimony in particular showed the entire nation that January 6th was an attack on the Capitol. It was a potential constitutional crisis in terms of how it was unfolding on Capitol Hill. But that testimony shows us it was also a crisis in the American presidency. Was then President Trump doing his duty as commander in chief of the U.S. military. There was an attack on the Capitol, the Houses of Congress, and he was sitting idle in the Oval Office or in the dining room just a few steps away, and it fell to the Vice President to make calls to the National Guard. And it raises real questions about who's in charge in the United States and the rest of the world, as Bob Woodward and I documented, were on high alert about the stability of the United States. It's something that's almost hard to think about, that the rest of the world was wondering is the United States stable? That's right. And, and General Milley worried about who was in charge beyond just that moment. Scott, at the end of, this, at the, end of the hearing, the Chairman Thompson said something tantalizing about the Proud Boys uh, and the administration. What did you make of that? Absolutely struck by how much time was spent Thursday talking about the Proud Boys by this committee. The revelation at the end was that the Proud Boys, according to the committee, was doing reconnaissance the morning of January 6th before President Trump ever spoke and that they were looking for vulnerabilities, places to lead the mob into the Capitol. Now, the Justice Department has charged the Proud Boys with seditious conspiracy. In fact, they were in court that morning to plead not guilty. That the January 6th committee is so interested in them is striking. That they were referenced a half dozen times in the opening hearing is striking because it's clear this committee is going to draw some kind of line between the Proud Boys and the organizers of the rally, potentially President Trump. We know of two ties already. Famously, President Trump said stand back and stand by to the Proud Boys. And they played part of the uh, interviews they had with Proud Boys members Thursday in which they said... That was an incitement to action. But also, Bob and I have reported about possible combinations and a nexus between the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys. We know from the court filings, a member of the Oath Keepers, the leader of the Oath Keepers, is accused of trying to call Donald Trump during the riot. Nancy, what else struck you in this hearing? You know, I think uh, it was really eye-opening as someone who was at the Capitol that day to see these depositions 
with uh, the president's family members, with his advisors, talking about how strenuously they tried to get him to do something to make that call, the Department of Defense, to bring in the National Guard, and the fact that he refused to do it. When you, when you look at those Capitol Police officers who were getting beaten up, when you know that there were lawmakers who were sitting ducks, and this you know ravenous crowd came within a couple of minutes of actually being able to get to them in the House and Senate chambers, to hear these individuals say, I tried to tell him he needed to, to act and he wouldn't do it. That was, you know, even though we know from Bob's reporting, from Scott's reporting, we've known that already, but to hear it from their mouths was really fascinating. And then beyond that, to know that those same individuals, while behind the scenes they were telling the president, you need to act, they were also telling him that, you know, there was no there there when it came to the fraud he was talking about. In public, they were still supporting him. They were still standing by him as he spread this misinformation. Bob Nancy talks about hearing it from the mouths of advisors. So given the central role that Mike Pence played on that day, don't we need to hear from Mike Pence? Uh, Vice, former Vice President Pence is probably not going to cooperate with this committee. You're not going to see him play some kind of John Dean role with his hand in the air. But we are likely to hear from people who could not be closer to Pence. Greg Jacob, his former counsel, who was part of crafting that statement Pence came up with on the morning of January 6th, and also Mark Short, Pence's former chief of staff. They have cooperated extensively with the committee so far, and based on our report, and they are likely to testify under, the, uh, under a subpoena in the coming weeks, and that will help us fill in the gaps of the intense pressure campaign Pence was under. Recall, it wasn't just that Trump was asking Pence to walk away from the proceedings on January 6th. Trump wanted to weaponize the vice presidency to try to stay in power. So we'll hear both about uh, how the vice president's office was taking this pressure, but then also what the vice president did in that moment, responding to these riots. Scott, uh, what, what questions do you want to have answered or hear answered in the, these remaining? And which ones do you think we'll still never have an answer to after the hearings one are done? One million and one questions, John. <laughs> Here's this unique challenge for the committee. They have this tidal wave of evidence and records, 140,000 records. And they have to dispense it in these drinking glass sized servings for America. One thing they probably won't be getting to is, did the conspiracy include the person who deposited those pipe bombs? outside the RNC and DNC headquarters. We are 17 months later and they are nowhere in the FBI in finding that person. And it was clearly coinciding with the attack on the Capitol. But the bigger question, what legislation do they propose coming out of this? The committee has been unequivocal. They're gonna draft new law. Is it just changing the Electoral Count Act to prevent January 6, 2025? If so, the Senate has made some progress on that. Bob, we have 20 seconds left. What was, you were in the room. In the room. What was it like? Deadly serious. I mean, I thought back to what it what must have been like during Watergate, during those hearings in 1973, because you realize this wasn't just about a crime. Watergate wasn't just about a crime. This wasn't just about an attack. It was about systemic shock to the American system. And you could feel it, see it in the testimony that day. All right, we'll have more testimony next week. Thanks to all three of you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.